All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome, this is the uh, Kubernetes uh, SIG architecture intro and update. Um, my name is John Bellamerick. Um, I'm at Google and I'm one of the co-chairs of the SIG. Uh, I'm David Eads. I am a chair and tech lead for API machinery and tech lead for auth and heavily involved in a lot of SIG Arch projects. Uh, uh, yeah, he's a sub-project uh, owner, I think, on some yes. of the things. So. Um, so what we'll do is um, go through a little bit about where SIG architecture fits in the big picture for uh, Kubernetes. Um, Essentially, SIG, architect uh, SIG architecture owns kind of the design principles, or architectural principles, and a lot of the development policies for uh, the Kubernetes, entire Kubernetes project. Um, we work to make sure that everything that gets built, you know, it, it follows these kind of goals that I've got listed here of portability, um, meeting users part way, flexible, extensible, um, and, and sort of uh, just ensure those, those general principles. We also kind of uh, are the place where we, we, you know, one of the, the, the SIGs where we try to emphasize the, the community values. And if you look at some of these, a number of these really are, they're values, but they're also, but they're not sort of code of conduct type values. These are values, they're technical values, right? Like distribution is better than centralization. Like this is a sort of policy for how we structure our community, but it has consequences in the technical outcome of, of, of what we deliver. Um, so we, we try to distribute the knowledge, we try to distribute the, the, uh, uh, the functionality, um, but then we have to come back and, and, and part of our job as that is, is kind of avoid uh, Conway's law, which if you're familiar with that, it's a sort of software development principle that you ship your organization. And so we don't want to ship the Kubernetes structure, so it also kind of falls back on us sometimes to try to break those silos. So we, we need the silos for independent action, but we need to break the silos so that we get a consistent API, for example, across the entire, um, uh, the entire project, or we get a consistent bar for production readiness. So a lot of our sub-projects are focused across sort of taking a look at what the SIGs are doing and evaluating whether they meet the bar and, and of consistency across the project. Yeah, you might say like we really want every part of the project to move forward, we want it to move forward quickly, but we, we don't want everything to start looking like differentiated uh, where people pull away. Exactly, it needs yeah. to be like one Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to step back a little bit, this is talking about those silos. This is kind of what the overall Kubernetes project looks like. And when we say that distribution versus centralization thing, it's about putting the decisions as far down into these boxes as possible. So we have um, different Organ different organizational concepts within the Kubernetes project. We have committees, um, like Code of Conduct Committee, uh, the Security Response Committee, and the Steering Committee. We have um, special interest groups. So this is, uh, they can be divided sort of into project level things um, or horizontal things that apply kind of across different areas of functionality, or they can be vertically focused on specific uh, sets of functionality. Um, and I guess this, this, this diagram, if you uh, look at some of the old uh, versions of this talk, you'll see a similar diagram, but there have been a few changes. We've added a few working groups specifically around uh, hardware management, so device management, and around uh, serving for uh, AI inference workloads to try and make sure that Kubernetes can meet the demands of these newer workloads that we have. Yeah. And Part of the reason that's necessary, right, is that working groups turn over over time, right? SIGs own Thanks. code, working groups actually try to work across the SIGs, solve a particular focused problem, and then the work output that they produce is something that SIGs will maintain for the long term, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the, the SIGs own code, or usually SIGs have sub-projects which own code, but, but basically SIGs own code, working groups don't. SIGs are permanent structures that go on forever, and working groups come together as kind of a joint project between a number of SIGs and then are dissolved when they've solved the problem that they're, that they're after. So we actually dissolved several, several working groups over the last few years as well. All right. Um, the scope of SIG architecture uh, is here on this slide. I'm not gonna drill into each of these because in a few minutes, uh, David will go through them all in detail. Um, but effectively, the things that I was talking about before, these kind of uh, broad scope type of um, 
uh, concepts and principles and consistency across the, the organization. We um, manage as part of that um, a number of uh, sort of those processes to ensure those, those principles that we, that we just looked at a minute ago, and we document those policies. And when there's a, when there's a, a question, people come to us and we have bi-weekly meetings in public, and we all debate what we think the right thing to do. And today, later, like David has a proposal around uh, how we manage uh, alpha, beta, GA uh, functionality and feature prog progress, and he's going to go into e detail about one of those. It's, it's the kind of thing we do regularly, um, but we also would love feedback from a broader audience, so he'll, he'll be talking more about that momentarily. Um, finally, we also serve a little bit of sort of a catch-all, so things that fall between those siloed cracks a lot of times end up in SIG architecture. Um, the common things are, you know, well, SIG node wants to do it this way, and SIG scheduling wants to do it that way, and, you know, they don't know what, the, what would be most uh, consistent with the principles of Kubernetes, or how do we come up with a way to do it that satisfies both. Um, we're not an we're not ex escalation point in that sense, like we're not any more important than any other SIG, but we are a common place for people to come together and make those, those kind of, have those kind of discussions. And it's a great spot for SIGs who are like, I, I don't know, uh, Node, remember Node came a while back and they're like, hey, we want to run a server. How should we secure this? Right, exactly, uh, right? right? And so you have that discussion because at SIG Arch you get a lot of representatives from all the SIGs are there. Exactly, yeah. right, so, so questions, cross, cross SIG kind of questions often land in SIG architecture. Um, finally, as I mentioned, SIGs have sub-projects, and that's kind of where the work gets done. Um, these are the sub-projects in, uh, in SIG architecture, and uh, David is going to go through each one of these in, in detail, so I'm going to hand it off to him now. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, so one of the big ones heavily associated with, with SIG architecture is API review. And there's a lot of confusion here, actually. The, the architecture SIG does not actually own the APIs. The owners of these APIs are the individual SIGs themselves. But we do have consistent review across all of the APIs by a relatively small number of people to ensure that they are consistent, that the APIs work as a unit and you can have consistent expectations across them, right? It's consistent for you know, things as simple as field names and, and how the values are structured, but also consistency for clients in the behavior of how they work, right? Is this API going to work successfully with a GitOps revert, for instance, is a common thing that you look at in an API review to try to make a decision. Uh, and so the people that we have as API approvers on the projects are people with deep expertise in how that works. They're usually going to be people who have reviewed APIs over a series of years uh, and have watched how their choices have aged. Um, another key part that you'll notice is semantics over time, right? Uh, a lot of Cube APIs, uh, you end up with heavily skewed client usage, right? You might be at cube 132, but the client was made at cube 127. Please update that. But you see people doing it. And you need those different clients to actually interoperate together and not have unexpected or erroneous behavior when old clients try to interact with new clients. Uh, another common thing on this, you can see this is a very passionate topic for me and for well, a lot of people. I'll say David, is, is the Kubernetes project has four API reviewers for the entire project. David is one of them. So, you know, he, he said it's people with a lot of experience, but if you want to participate or if you're already in the community, this is an area we really could use help. It takes a long time to get there, but it's sort of the pinnacle of, uh, one of the pinnacles, maybe the pinnacle of, of a Kubernetes contributor to be an API reviewer, so, approver. So, uh, <laughs> Please come join us, help us out, because everything new that goes into Kubernetes, he, has, he or one of other three other people have to look at. Yeah, it would be, it would be really helpful. I mean, that, that evolution over time, looking at the mistakes we've made, uh, there's some helpful links here so that, you know, even if you aren't going to be doing that, uh, looking through and saying what mistakes have been made in the past, why did we make this choice, uh, and how these guidelines make it easier to, to write and interoperate with our system over time. 
So you know, we have these APIs. How do we make sure those APIs actually work consistently across the vendors? And that's what conformance testing is for, right? Uh, conformance tests are sort of a special kind of E2E test. It's not just E2E for a feature. It is E2E for a feature that says, if this test does not pass, your distribution, whichever vendor you are, cannot use the Kubernetes branding, right? Every time you release your product, uh, if you're a Kubernetes vendor, you have to actually stand up a cluster, write down how you did it, run this special set of conformance tests, and report the result back to the CNCF. Uh, and all those steps are critical, right? Uh, particularly the bit about how did we set up this cluster. Uh, they get submitted. You can look at historical values and current ones online. But what is contained in those conformance tests is decided by SIG architecture. Um, and as part of that effort, there has been a, uh, a push to get conformance testing on every API that we have. Right. Well, so a few years ago, we had extraordinarily poor coverage for conformance tests. So there, something like you know, 30 or 40% of all the APIs were part of the conformance suite. And so, uh, and I can see a few uh, of the folks here who helped build out all of that, um, those conformance tests over the last few years. Um, really, really impressive effort. And uh, they, they, yes, we've achieved uh, in one, well, in 132, we will achieve 100% coverage for uh, all of the uh, uh, public APIs. Uh, yeah, I was assured on Monday it was 100%, but when I looked at the chart, it was like 99.8 or something. So I'll follow up on that, but it's looking very, <laughs> very good. Uh, another part of it is how do we actually organize the code? Uh, and code organization is actually less about how do we factor Kubernetes, uh, although the KK repo shape is part of it. It's more about how do we manage our dependencies. We have hundreds of dependencies that we rely on. Uh, and every single one of them introduces some level of risk or problem, right? How do you update it? How do we get CVE service? Uh, do we have duplicates that are trying to do the same thing but maybe aren't quite compatible? Uh, and then the dreaded diamond dependency. Um, and so I'm sure if many of you have built on top of Kubernetes, you may have experienced this. Uh, there is actually a working group inside of SIG architecture that tries to make it as good as we possibly can. Um, and it's just continual. They're handling cases of this needs to be updated, this one needs to be added, uh, this one needs a new tag. Or, or you know, a, a repository is gone, uh, you know, oh. is gotten orphaned, right? Like, what, what do you do if somebody stops maintaining it? Um, and so all of those type of issues are part of the subproject for a code organization. Yeah. Uh, they have a heavy reliance on CI and, like, well-trod paths for trying to update these. Uh, and abandonment is, of, regrettably, a, a fairly common issue we deal with. Uh, so then how do new features actually come into uh, our our project here. Uh, it's through this enhancement process. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, the goal here is for us to have sort of a historical record of everything that went in, uh, what we were thinking when we put it in, what we were trying to solve, how we knew that we were finished, uh, and uh, it's like how the organization remembers, right? Because over time, there actually is a significant amount of turnover. Some people have been here for a long time, but even for those of us who have been here, it's really useful to be able to look back and say, all right, what was supposed to be finished for this in order for it to reach its first beta? Uh, how was I supposed to monitor this when it went into production? Um, it is very important to note that SIG architecture does not own approving the designs. We own what needs to go into it, but the SIGs actually own deciding, is this good enough? Does this meet a threshold? Um, that's, that's mostly true. There uh, are the two processes that, that SIG architecture owns, the API review and production readiness. And so approvals from both of those, depending on the, 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 the design that's going in, but, but approval from both of those are needed. But the actual like functional design, that's completely owned by the SIG and up to the SIG leadership to approve. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned production readiness reviews. Actually, the next slide here. Uh, so we introduced these a few years back when we noticed uh, we were having difficulty actually supporting features as they went into production. You'd end up with questions with like, uh, is this broken? I can't tell if it's, I think it might be broken. Um, well, okay, it's broken. It's definitely broken now. How do I turn it off? If I turn it off, how do I turn it back on? 
Uh, that's actually a shockingly difficult one. Um, what are the consequences of it being off? Is there a restart policy? There's a tremendous amount of information that goes in to production readiness, and participation has been really, really good over the past couple years. Uh, I think it's an example of a, of a, a project we have that worked really well. Um, and so we're gonna keep this one. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to John to talk about where we're headed to the SIG. Thank you. So what, what are we working on now? Like what's our current active thing? And I think that um, SIG architecture is involved in a lot of things, right? We are co-sponsors on a lot of working groups. And from our point of view, there's sort of three key factors that Kubernetes needs to deal with in, the, in our current world. One is uh, continuing to build reliability and our PRR process is part of that. Um, the, and, and the topic David's gonna cover in a minute on, on higher beta thresholds also falls into the reliability bucket and the sort of trust for upgrades. So there's a, a, a new feature going in and, and well, David mentioned the enhancements process. We call those CAPS, Kubernetes Enhancement Proposals. So every feature that goes into Kubernetes ha, has a CAP associated with it. It's a design document and uh, production readiness and everything. There's one out there right now for something called compatibility versions, which I'm sure there was a talk or two on uh, here uh, this week, but I, I, I unfortunately didn't put the reference to it in. But um, where we're working on separating out the binary version from the API version, which can make, uh, for example, upgrading the binary version to catch uh, CVEs uh, and, and prepare CVEs without impacting all of the projects, you, or all of the API clients that are on top of it because the behavior stays the same as the previous version. So this is super cool and it will kind of ease upgrade process and uh, help people uh, manage their upgrades better. So that sort of trusted upgrade that you can continuously stay up to date, do your security patches without breaking your world uh, is, is super important to the project going forward. The, the second area we see as really significant is uh, adapting to the, the new world we're living in where there's two new types of workloads and those workloads uh, make use of really specialized hardware and expensive scarce hardware. We're talking about AI ML typically and GPUs which are tremendously expensive. You don't want them sitting idle. You don't want to make uh, poor choices about which ones you use and Kubernetes um, up until now, Kubernetes management of hardware has been to sort of treat hardware as very fungible, right? That's, that's where we came from. The world we came from was, was trying to make, a, 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 you know, cattle not pets, right? Trying to make the hardware very fungible across uh, the workloads. That works for a lot of the things we've been traditionally doing. Doesn't work as well for these newer types of workloads. So we have a working group that's been formed. Um, from uh, architecture node, scheduling, uh, a few others. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty broad scope, um, but we're really focused tightly on um, managing how Kubernetes relates to the hardware. And uh, the link in here, this, I think I put this on, this, on the session as a PDF, um, or I will afterwards if I didn't yet, but uh, we had a talk yesterday about that, so we're not gonna drill too much into it here, but, but it's su super interesting if you're interested in that area. The, the third kind of forward-looking thing as a project we think is important is uh, also adapting to the new types of workloads. So the, the, th there's a number of frameworks out there for running and building uh, uh, AI and ML uh, workloads, for, for running them, rather, and um, Kubernetes can't like, do all of that for everything, right? These frameworks have a real uh, significant um, set of functionality that they deliver to their end users. But what we do want to make sure is that, we, that Kubernetes is the best place to run those frameworks. Things like Ray, uh, you know, we want to make sure that, that's th that we become the best place to run that rather than just uh, uh, the way people access their infrastructure so people do it because that's how they get to their infrastructure. Not, we, we, don't, we want them to like really uh, get value out of Kubernetes. So part of that is making us work better with the hardware, which these need, but part of it is also building out new uh, functionality around there, th those areas. So there's a working group called Working Group Serving, which is targeted around uh, LLM inference, um, or rather just inference, but they're, they're building like an LLM gateway. That's part of what they're working on. Um, there's 
new work, work, uh, workload controllers like leader worker set that map to some of these frameworks better than our existing deployments and, and daemon sets and, and stateful sets. And then there's a, a, a kind of very future looking um, proposal around dynamic pods. What does that mean? We have out of SIG node, we have things like uh, in place pod updates where you can uh, update the resources associated with a, with a pod on the fly. Um, we have uh, some proposals around how uh, containers could be scheduled to pods rather than just pods scheduled to nodes. So these, these have some characteristics that may improve the functioning of all of these different frameworks. So we're working hard as a community to do that, um, and, and that kind of goes across many different SIGs, and, and SIG architecture is one of the, the, those involved. So with all that said, um, I'm going to hand it over to David again, who's going to detail some of his uh, proposals around um, the beta, uh, the, the progression. Feature, 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 yeah, feature life cycle. Feature life right, cycle. So, Thank you. So uh, in spite of everyone saying for like three years, Cube is boring, it turns out there's still a lot of features people want. <laughs> and we keep trying to deliver them. Uh, and, and what I want to do is actually step through the life of a feature. So we can look and say, is that the life cycle we expect? or are some of us surprised by how things actually roll out as we add features to our system? So before you even get to an alpha, there is a set of things you really need to do, right? It's you gotta find the right SIG, because remember, they actually own all the code. Working groups can help here. SIG Arch can help direct, but you do have to find the right SIG. Um, and then I strongly suggest having a low energy evaluation of the idea, right? Go to a meeting, start a, a post on the message board, uh, and figure out, is there interest? What are the core requirements this SIG wants to see before it will even consider a design? Uh, and then start writing up that enhancement. And you'll go through, and it'll take a while. Uh, these reviews are pretty thorough. Uh, and you'll come up with a list of alpha, beta, and stable criteria. And so you then move into alpha, right? And in alpha, you are default off in prod. You can turn it on when it suggests turning it on in prod. Uh, and you're supposed to be able to turn it back off and then turn it back on again. And there are checks for that. Uh, but here in this stage, you're looking at things that are often incomplete, right? Uh, we have taken it fairly far, but not fully finished. Uh, or you'll often find things that are lightly tested, right? It'll be in. We just managed to finish it. We haven't built out a comprehensive test suite for all the functionality. That's expected in alpha. Right? There is no upgrade guarantee. If you turn this on, you, you may have to turn it back off before you're able to upgrade. A there's, bunch of there's details. There's no API like deprecation guarantees either. We can The next release, it can be gone. The next release, the API can change completely. Right. right. And so it's very easy to hit this threshold. And it's also easy when you're considering PRR. But then there's a huge jump to beta. Uh, and you see this uh, in terms of what we require for enhancement updates. Um, because beta is default available in prod, right? This means that if it's a feature that isn't controlled by the API and it isn't controlled by flag, it's just on. Uh, when you install a beta feature, when you install a new level of cube, the beta features are all, almost all, on. And, and that's why PRR ends up becoming very important. We have monitoring requirements, and the beta criteria are pretty high, but at this stage, Oftentimes, sometimes, uh, the features themselves are not complete. Sometimes there are actual known testing gaps. Um, and it's not clear that everyone expects this in their production clusters. Now, there is one detail here. It must be disableable. Uh, and that is very important. So you can think of this as sort of like the, the soft try in prod. We're going to turn it on for everybody. If it goes bad, you can turn them off individually. And there may end up being a recovery procedure to turn them off and then upgrade again turn it back on. Um, and then you have stable features. And this is what you would expect. They are unconditionally available. You can no longer choose to turn it off. They might have flags where you can say, like, oh, I don't want to use this authorizer, for instance. Uh, or there may be an API field you have to select to actually use it. But they are unconditionally available. Uh, and the APIs, are, like the fields, are always present. You can no longer strip them. You can't remove them. Uh, and so uh, these are the levels that we have now. I've just got one slide showing all of it. Um, but I'm hoping to prompt some discussion, even if it's not here, uh, in future SIG architecture meetings. I think we're going to be talking about an idea uh, for whether the threshold for beta is currently correct, 
what do people actually expect for completion of features that are turned on in production clusters by default? Uh, are there stability expectations, right? Is, do we expect full test coverage? How do we balance the risks? At some point, it's gotta be turned on for the first time. Um, but how can, we, how can we make beta more like GA with slightly less confidence? Right, so, so one of the, the issues we have with this feature lifecycle is we, we as developers, we, we build an alpha feature with the hope that we'll get feedback from users, but nobody turns it on. Right? So the reason that beta has been on by default since early days of Kubernetes is because it's the only way we get anybody to use it. And so you know, if we just say, no, no, we'll just make beta off by default too, how do we get that feedback? We're back, we may as well be in alpha. So it, it's kind of a very tricky question. Yeah, there's risks on both sides, right? Uh, at some point, you have to turn it on for the first time, and you need to have a stage where it's on for the first time and still able to be disabled. Uh, and, and so we're trying to find where that balance point is. So uh, I think here is a good point. Um, questions, if anyone has them, on whatever, whatever SIG Arch topic you'd like. Uh, I've got one in the back there. There's a mic right behind there's you. There's a mic behind you, yeah, you can go. If you want to mind. Dynamic sports. Can you ex bit elaborate on that? Can you, just can you speak up a little bit? It's a little quiet. A little closer to the mic. Dynamic pods. You mentioned it in one of the bullet points. Can you extend a bit where to find more information about that? Um, I don't have like a specific link right now. I would have to go dig it up. But if you want to uh, ping me, um, if you're on the, I don't know if you're on the Kubernetes Slack. If you are, you can you can ping me, John Bell America, just my name. Um, or go on SIG Architecture channel and ask if we can find, there's a few different proposals out there. Many of them are very, very early. They were sent out to like the KDEV uh, mailing list and stuff. Um, in place pod updates is actually, it went beta. In, it's going beta in 132, I think. Uh, at least they tried. Uh, there was an exception and. Yeah, I think they made it. Okay, um, awesome. So in place pod updates is sort of like under that broader umbrella of like making the pod more dynamic. Um, right now that's CPU and memory. Eventually we would add devices to that like for, for like with GRA, but it's gonna be a couple releases. So it's super complicated, all of these things. It, they sound simple like on the surface, but when you start d drilling into all the edge cases, it's kind of insane. So it's taken a long time for something like in-place pod update to get there. Um, but there's other proposals around, like I said, kind of like, uh, sort of like we have ephemeral containers that are currently just debug containers, but maybe we could have containers that are, uh, can be added like that dynamically, but our actual um, you know, workload user containers. So there's proposals around that. We'll, we'll see where, where they land. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Got another question back here. Uh, what is the way of uh, becoming a PRR shadow reviewer? Great question. It is. Uh, so uh, David and I are actually two of the, the PRR approvers. So um, what we have for that shadowing program is um, you just reach out to us um, on, on the PRR. Uh, there's a prod readiness review channel um, on the Kubernetes Slack. That's the easiest way. Or come to the meeting. We have meetings every two weeks. Um, but uh, the, basically, you just jump in. Every the way the process works, the the, the release pro, the release process is uh, there's a release team. They put together a, um, or rather the SIG. Every SIG opts in for the features or caps that they want to have. They want to propose for the next cycle a, as they're developing them. And then the release team builds a, a big uh, GitHub project. And part of that project board, uh, there's a PRR approver and a PRR shadow, um, and uh, so you'd come to our meeting, we would kind of talk to you about what we do, um, and then you'd just join in one cycle and you'd just pick up a few of those caps. You'd do the PRR reviews. Um, a great, uh, like you don't have to be a, a software developer to do these actually. What you, you, you know, an operator is a great person to do these. So like there are Google SREs who are our software developers too, but like their primary focus is on like great operations and um, the, the they would make really good, a lot of this process comes from them originally anyway. But uh, so um, in any case, join us there. We're super welcoming. You'll see both of us there all the time and um, a few other folks and uh, you can just jump right in. And, and I'll say there's a, there's a sort of set of criteria. So once you've done it for a few cycles, then you can kind of like apply to be an approver if you meet a certain set of bar. Yeah, uh, the timing on this is gonna be, uh, let's see, come to a PRR meeting. It's on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday. 
uh, maybe six weeks to a month before Cap Freeze, we'll start planning what we're going to be doing. Uh, and then plan to be able to spend some time uh, in the two weeks leading up to the enhancements freeze to actually go through and review what's out there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no problem. Uh, is that another question? Or oh, All right, come on up. Um, hello. Um, my question is about the release cadence for Kubernetes. Um, but I'm not sure if this is the appropriate SIG for this. Does SIG architecture control the, the version release cadence and how that version release goes? So it's a good question. We don't control anything. Um, I mean, we, d we do some policies and things, but like that is a question, a kind of broader community question. So that would be between SIG release and SIG architecture for the most part. Yeah, it would be a good place to discuss it. It would certainly come up at a SIG architecture meeting, but we wouldn't like unilaterally make a decision. It would definitely be something where SIG release is involved and all the other SIGs would actually come and discuss um, discuss what it should be. You want to do You want to do 12 releases a year? Uh, down. <laughs> 12 <laughs> releases a year, let's do it. Uh, I'm sure you predict probably what I was going to ask. More along um, long terms, having a long-term support um, Kubernetes version, but I, I acknowledge that this is not the appropriate um, SIG to like speak about. Well, it's a broader community discussion here. I, I, it's a little hard to, to hear you, but I think you said about long-term support. Yes, having, so, having so there's a, a yeah. yeah, I'll say there's a wor working group yeah. called Working Group Long-Term Support that is focused on that question. We actually had a working group. They made a decision. We extended the, the support by one release, basically, and then we dissolved that group, and it came back again. I, I think that that's under discussion. Uh, realistically, there's a lot of problems with that, and we already spend millions of dollars on CI, and it would like double or triple that. So I don't think we have the money to do that. But the the, um, the there are the compatibility version piece I was talking about that actually can solve a lot of the same problems. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for but, uh, at yeah. least, uh, covering the question. Oh, good. No problem. Yeah, and and feel free to join up with uh, working group LTS. They, that's what they're working on. I'm curious, uh, regarding the alpha, beta, GA phased process, uh, do you think of um, entry APIs in the same way as CRD APIs, apart from feature gates, or are there differences? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, Good question. so <laughs> it is. Uh, feature gates are a uniquely Kubernetes thing right now, right? It's a code level check, uh, which is essentially giant global single instance hash map, and you say, am I enabled or am I not? The promotion of particular fields inside of an existing API uh, is one category of change that is feature-gated um, and also impacts the API. And in that case, um, the existing fields are, are stripped. Often when this question comes up, though, uh, the question isn't about that and it's not about features that don't have APIs at all. The question is about what do we do with features that do have a brand new API that is no longer served by default? How do I actually enable it when my feature is in beta? Um, and that is a fair question. Um, a couple, couple years back, I guess it was also actually also me, uh, there was an effort to avoid permabeta. One of the problems that we had as a project was that the APIs um, were getting to beta, and they were served by default, and then they never went GA because no one ever had the willingness to say, all right, people move your manifests after three years of using it. Right, um, so, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make a comment there. Well, one thing I want to make sure is clear, feature gates, APIs, CRDs, all different things, and so feature gates being beta or not is related but not, not direct one-to-one -one with the APIs being beta or not. Yeah, and I, I just mentioned feature gates because they're something that's available for in-core APIs, but not so much for CRD APIs, right? I was thinking more of the general process for an API going in-core API, or entry API, sorry, going through alpha beta graduation, and should that be the, exactly the same? Do you think of it in exactly the same way for CRD-based APIs, or should there be differences? And I do I'm think... also, too, about being able to enable disable them, because CRDs, obviously, uh, you can disable them by just deleting them, but then everything goes away. Uh, uh, I do think about them very similarly. Uh, I think about them usually in terms of definitions of a different schema. When I have an alpha schema, it is different. Uh, I will say, I think Gateway API is probably the biggest API going through this. They had some interesting ideas uh, earlier in the week from Rob. Um, every choice has trade-offs. Uh, and I don't know 
that just having feature gates will actually alleviate all of their problems. But it's a, it's a great topic, uh, and that's probably where to drill down as we work with them. Yeah, I would say it's, re it's still an unsolved problem. There's, yeah. It's very challenging in that machinery is not necessarily all there. Um, I wanted to make one other comment about something David said. So, so the perma beta thing, it's, it's not just because, oh, we want to push developers into making, like, the, 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 the APIs being served by default when they're beta caused enormous pain for our users when we removed those beta APIs. So, so beta APIs don't live forever. And so we don't want people kind of accidentally using beta APIs without acknowledging that they're taking on the burden to update all their bazillion manifests across their entire organization when that beta API is, turn, is, is turned down. So yeah. that's kind of the, really to me, for, for, for like for GKE and stuff, we're out of time, is, uh, is why, why the perma beta was so important. I agree. Uh, but yeah, definitely come if you'd like to talk it through.